Okay. Hello and welcome to ASEPs and CCOs HER2 Testing in Breast Cancer Improving IHC Performance video conference. My name is Dara Oaken and I'm a learning experience designer at ASEP and I will be facilitating today's session. A copy of the disclosures can be seen on the screen. In addition, today's session is funded by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca and Daiichi Sankyo Incorporated. Please note that this video conference is being recorded and live streamed on ASCP's Facebook page. And by participating, you're agreeing that ASCP may use the recording of your image and statements on ASCP's Facebook page, website, and YouTube channels. So before we start, let's take a moment for introductions. Please type in your name, your title, and institution into the chat. Good to see you here. As you introduce yourselves in the chat, let's introduce our presenters for today. Dr. Aisha Sahin is Professor and Section Chief in the Department of Pathology, Division of Pathology Lab Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Downs Kelly is Director of Breast Pathology at Cleveland Clinic, and Dr. Allie Brown is Chief Officer of Medical Quality and American Society for Clinical Pathology. So today is the second of two HER2 low breast cancer tumor boards, this one with a focus on testing and improving IHC performance. Dr. Brown will cover current guidelines for scoring HER2 IHC and factors that may affect IHC performance. Dr. Downs Kelly will discuss updated scoring for HER2 ISH HER2 heterogeneity and HER2 low tumors. And Dr. Sahin will share a case-based practical application of HER2 scoring and reporting challenges. After the presentation, we'll encourage discussion. So please feel free to type in questions into the chat and we will address them post-presentation. A few final reminders. Before we start, please keep your microphone on mute until you raise your hand to speak during question times. And also please do not share any protected health information or personally identifiable information about patients. Finally, CME CMLE credit is available for this event and instructions for claiming credit will be shared at the end of the presentation, will be available on our breast cancer website and will also be sent to the email address you provided at registration. So now I'll turn it over to the presenters to share their slides and begin. Thank you so much, Dara. Let me get this in presentation mode. It's nice to be with everyone again today and with my colleagues. We're gonna talk a little bit more about HER2 testing um, and some comments on HER2 low breast tumors. So the objectives today um, are to uh, appropriately be able to score HER2 levels in immunohistochemistry for both routine and complex cases in accordance with guidelines to describe factors that can affect IHC performance, uh, the utilization of in situ hybridization testing in accordance with guidelines, and then talking about ways to prepare for HER2 low breast cancer identification, tracking, and reporting. And then we want to be able to apply principles of leadership to engage and inform members of the cancer team around the ongoing HER2 low research. So as we spoke about before, and as everyone has heard, the ASCO CAP guideline recommendations were updated in 2018. Uh, the overall goal of the guideline recommendations are to improve the accuracy of HER2 testing by developing algorithms that specify specimen handling, um, how to determine which assay you're going to use, and reporting criteria and also defining positive equivocal and negative values, particularly for IHC, but it also touches on fluorescence in situ hybridization and SISH. So the tissue handling requirements, which have hopefully been burned into your brain uh, by now are, you know, are, are quite clear that uh, you can use multiple types of specimens. It's not just limited to biopsies or resections, but really any type of tissue that there needs to be a cold ischemia time, preferably less than one hour, and this needs to be reported, and that tissue should be fixed in 10% neutral buffered formalin for between six and 72 hours. If you'll remember, the original guideline stated six to 48 hours, 
which caused some issues as far as laboratories that didn't have processing personnel on the weekend, but that was eventually extended for uh, six to 72 hours. Uh, that validated protocols should be used for testing and that labs need to show 95% concordance with an already, already validated test. So let's talk a little bit about scoring, not scorning. This is a very negative way to go through this presentation, scoring and performance. So again, uh, starting with the FDA criteria when assays were first developed for the initial clinical trials for Herceptin, we've gone through several uh, versions of the guidelines and the most recent focused update. So the basic interpretation of zero, one plus, both being negative, the two plus equivocal category, and then three plus positive. So according to the most updated guidelines, the negative score of zero is when you have no staining or incomplete staining in less than or equal to 10% of tumor cells. So a very small amount of staining can be present or no staining at all. Then of course, the one plus negative group uh, has incomplete membrane staining that's in greater than 10% of tumor cells, but no circumferential staining, no dark staining or anything like that. So this can be diffused throughout the tumor, but it is faint and or barely perceptible. Now, again, these one plus negative tumors, these patients, if they have negative fish, are eligible for these HER2 low clinical trials that we've been talking about in our previous talk and that we'll talk about again some today. So it's important to distinguish between the zero and the one plus category. Two plus or equivocal, who are also patients that are eligible for trials if their HER2 fish is negative, is weak to moderate complete membrane staining in greater than 10% of tumor cells or the complete membrane staining that's intense, but it's in a very small proportion of the cells. So less than or equal to 10% of tumor cells. And then of course the three plus positive, which is probably the easiest one for all of us to, to identify. And that is the complete intense membrane staining in greater than 10% of tumor cells. So the focused update did bring into account some rare staining patterns, which are of merit to discuss. So um, that is uh, tumors that have circumferential complete intense membrane staining uh, in less than or equal to 10% of tumor cells. That can be you know, kind of alarming and you wonder what to do. Of course, this is a score that should be then um, used, you need to use fish or some sort of alternative method to further evaluate these tumors. There's always the issue of tumoral heterogeneity, and that comes into play a lot more with in situ hybridization, and Dr. Downs Kelly will discuss that in that section. Then we have the tumors that have a moderate to intense uh, IHC staining in greater than 10% of tumor cells, but it's incomplete, and that's this classic basolateral or lateral pattern of staining, uh, which I'll show you an example of that we see uh, not infrequently in micropapillary patterns of carcinoma. And then there are the staining patterns that are discordant with tumor type, like a three plus positive in a lobular cancer, which certainly can happen, but it's unusual and you should always give pause uh, to when you see something like that and perhaps proceed to, uh, to fish. So here's a micropapillary carcinoma. Um, we're used to seeing this picture of these kind of inside out lumens uh, surrounded by a uh, clefting or space. And sometimes in these cancers, when we do HER2 immunohistochemistry, you'll see this basolateral or lateral pattern of, of staining. It's not circumferential, but it's distinct enough to warrant additional testing. So the recommendation is to perform further evaluation on these tumors with in situ hybridization. And you know, a fairly decent amount of these can be positive uh, when further evaluated. And actually, I know Dr. Downs Kelly's group uh, at Cleveland Clinic has done some research on that to find a fairly significant proportion of these do end up being positive via fish. And so this is the general recommendation on that. And again, here's a lobular carcinoma, classic lobular features, ECAD here in negative, that end up being three plus positive via immunohistochemistry, which certainly can happen, but uh, it is very uncommon. And I think in a case like that, it certainly would not be unwarranted to perform fish on a case like this for um, confirmation. Then there's the category of indeterminate results. That's when there's some sort of technical problem that does not allow reporting of a result. So uh, this indeterminate result would be in place of calling something positive, negative, or equivocal. Uh, this can be for multiple reasons, uh, some sort of improper specimen handling, 
crush or edge artifact, our old friend that we see from time to time, especially with core biopsies, uh, any sort of analytical phase testing failure. And in these instances, the recommendation is that additional tissue should be used for testing. Now, we all know that sometimes that is not possible, um, in which case you really have to use your best judgment and really exhaust any type of uh, testing that you potentially have available for that patient. But hopefully, in most cases, additional tissue is available for testing. Uh, it's not uncommon to have false positives via immunohistochemistry. Um, as we talked about before, the edge artifact or crush artifact, edge artifact can happen when there's pooling of antibody uh, during the preparation of the edges and that causes that edge artifact. Um, if you see cytoplasmic positivity, like in this case, which is the case that we had in our first virtual tumor board, where we had this granular cytoplasmic staining, that would be a false positive, right? Or we'd want to at least reflex this to further testing, maybe in situ hybridization, if you're not sure about the staining pattern, um, overstaining because of improper titration, and then the misinterpretation of DCIS. We've all had those cases where there's extensive high-grade DCIS, there's uh, chronic inflammation, irregular borders, and it can be quite difficult to pinpoint areas of invasion. So being very careful when, proper, when evaluating a case like that. And then also false negatives. So if you have, um, this is one of the reasons why the cold ischemia time of less than one hour is recommended. A prolonged cold ischemia time can potentially cause false negative HER2IHC. Uh, tumor heterogeneity, uh, you might have a small sample and then you know you got the area that is negative in some areas may be positive on a more significant sample. You know, sometimes you're not really doing anyone any favors. I know we all feel the pressure to to give a report and to give tumor cancer biomarker status for our patients with breast biopsies, but if the specimen is just not adequate enough, then it could be harmful. When having a small sample size, you really wanna question a negative HER2 result, uh, or at least make some sort of comment and uh, perhaps ask for additional tissue. If it's a higher grade tumor, um, if PR is negative or even weak, or if it's a high proliferative index on, with your KI67. Additionally, you can get false negative results because of titration issues when your antibody concentration is too low. So when thinking specifically about the HER2 low tumors, um, which to, to repeat again, um, there are clinical trials that patients have shown some promise for um, response to certain anti-HER2 uh, methods of treatment. And these patients are in the so-called HER2 low category which are patients who have a one plus or two plus immunohistochemistry result for HER2 and then have been reflexed to FISH and are FISH negative. So those patients are considered HER2 low uh, by the standards of these current clinical trials. Uh, we did have some questions after the last tumor board about proficiency testing. You know, currently you're judged for either a positive or negative result, not the different shades of negative, right? The one plus versus zero. I don't know of any, uh, anything coming in the pipeline to change that, but one would reason that if this becomes a standard of care and treatment that may end up happening, we may see that. I mean, it hasn't happened yet, um, but I think it's something to think about. And then the thoughts of reproducibility, because we know that at the lower end of the spectrum, we tend to see lower reproducibility, uh, you know, inter-observer results, which Dr. Downs Kelly is gonna talk about some more, particularly between zero and one plus. So with that, I'm gonna hand off to Dr. Downs Kelly, who's gonna talk a bit about HER2 IHC inter-observer variation. Thanks, Allie. I'm really gonna talk about this more so um, kind of in the, the uh, low HER2 realm. Um, and what I wanna present is actually a study that came out just since our last presentation. We presented kind of the HER2 low landscape on um, at the end of January and then February 3rd, this article was published in JAMA Oncology that really looked at um, how are we doing when we're looking at um, one plus and, and zero and kind of at the, the low end of the spectrum. So this study looked at two years worth of CAP HER2 immunohistochemistry proficiency tests from about 1400 um, different laboratories. And um, uh, each lab had two 10 core tissue microarrays. So these are what we score during, during our CAP proficiency tests, um, scored twice a year. And there were a total of 80 survey cases included. 
And then really the, the relative frequency and distribution of each one of the scores that we standardly provide, whether it's 0, 1 plus, 2 plus, or 3 plus, um, was recorded. And um, the study authors defined inter-rater agreement um, between labs as anything that was 70% or greater. Um, so if we, we break this down, we can see our concordance is much better if we're talking about bins of negative, meaning things were scored as zero um, versus the bin of positive, something scored as three plus. So 65% of those cases had 90% or greater concordance across laboratories. When we start to look at the zero or one plus, our uh, inner reader observer agreement definitely drops. So only 25% of those cores had a less than 70% inter-reader agreement. So really not good agreement in that low end. So then um, the study went on to also uh, include 18 breast pathologists reading um, 170 different HER2 um, IHC cases and again um, scoring with our uh, standard in um, uh, with our standard scoring system, and what they how they kind of did their statistics with this was if there was agreement on a single core by 17 of the 18 readers, then this represented greater than 90% agreement, and this was an, an acceptable value. Again, we can see that if we're talking about two plus and three plus, that um, you know there's 58% agreement there. Um, but if we're starting to look at zero and one plus, um, you know, the, the rate of uh, agreement uh, falls to about 26%. So if we look at either one of these cohorts, the largest areas of disagreement are in this low end. And that's really not surprising. And, you know, the study authors even said, um, to be fair, uh, you know, these 18 pathologists were not told that they were really thinking about discriminating between zero and one plus. So uh, in retrospect, some of the uh, participants said, if I would have known that we were really thinking about this low end, I would have spent more time um, kind of looking at, at the negative um, results and trying to discriminate between the two. Because right now, outside of the, the realm of clinical trials, uh, distinguishing between zero and one plus doesn't really have clinical effect at this point. Some of the other limitations were really that, you know, we're using TMAs when we look at CAP proficiency testing, and these are multiple levels. So there certainly could be some intratumoral heterogeneity. Is it, uh, we were not reading the, the, uh, the same cores. And then uh, the current HER2 IHC assays, um, we need to think about it. You know, they've been around for a long time, but they were really to identify patients who are three plus positive or two plus positive and go on to fish and are, are deemed to be amplified. So quantitatively, we uh, suffer from some inaccuracy in, the, in this low range. And whether some of it is interpretation or whether it is pre-analytics that, that play a role, um, uh, these are all things that, are, that, that should be considered. In this same uh, JAMA Oncology, uh, Drs. Allison and, and Wolf wrote an invited commentary and commented on the paper that we just discussed and also brought up some other issues. So, you know, they, they commented on this low discriminatory capability and the low end of the spectrum of HER2 staining. Um, and really, could a, a score of zero be an artifact from some pre-analytical issues? That's um, something to consider. And then do we need to really be concerned about differences in sensitivities of antibodies? Um, could this potentially create variability in this low range? And as always, you know, kind of intratumoral tissue heterogeneity um, can be an issue. And then are we even, you know, do we need to think about different assays um, if we're really starting to uh, determine zero versus one plus? Should we be thinking about potentially looking at messenger RNA? Now, none of this is clinically validated, and um, there are some studies out there, but we're, we're a long, long way from prime time with this, but they are bringing up these potential issues to, to keep in mind. So we talked last time about antibody drug conjugates, and this is trastuzumab that's linked to some sort of cytotoxic payload. And these are being used in clinical trials in the setting of advanced, uh, sorry, advanced breast cancer patients. The one that's interesting and that was presented um, uh, most recently at San Antonio Breast 
was this phase two trial that's looking at um, trastuzumab and DREX TCAN as a monotherapy in patients with metastatic breast carcinoma. And, you know, they, they've actually binned them into those that are HER2 positive, um, those that are HER2 low, meaning they're one plus or two plus in in situ hybridization negative. And then they have this HER2 non-expressing or those that are zero. And actually, in there was actually clinical activity shown in these patients, or at least in a subset of these patients who are deemed to be HER2 IHC zero. So I think there's lots of questions to be answered. And really, I think the clinical trials are gonna to need to answer who derives benefit. And then we're gonna to need to answer how are uh, the best means to select these patients and, and, and who's gonna derive the benefit. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about as far as the, the immunohistochemistry in um, the, the low um, HER2 category. And I now want to move on to in situ hybridization and really focus on um, groups two, three, and four, which were included in the updated um, 2018 guidelines. Um, this is just a, a schematic um, of what a dual fish, um, dual probe in situ hybridization would potentially look like. So um, typically there's some sort of centromeric enumeration probe. Um, typically, it's, it's a, a green uh, fluorochrome, and then um, HER2 is typically uh, has a red fluorochrome, and these uh, both hybridize to uh, either 17P or 17Q, and they're um, uh, used to be able to calculate the ratio. So in the update, it's really suggested and preferred that dual probe fish is used. Um, there are single probe assays where you're just looking at the HER2 copy number, but that is not going to uh, be able to give you the uh, ratios that are um, frequently worked with um, as we work through these different um, uh, ish, uh, genotypes. So it would be nice if all of our cases were this straightforward. On the left, we have an example of a HER2 non-amplified case where we see in an individual cell, there's two copies of our red probe and two copies of our green probe pretty uniformly throughout. So um, if we take the average uh, after you count 20 cells, and in our lab, we count 40 cells. If you read the package inserts, it's at least 20 cells. Um, and you, you add up a Across those 20 cells, what your HER2 copy number is, and uh, then you divide it by what your sub-17 copy number is, and you are provided a ratio. So a ratio that's greater than or equal to two is amplified, and anything less than two is, is not amplified. So what about these uncommon uh, in situ hybridization signal patterns that were really a lot of the, the focused update in 2018? I'm gonna kind of walk us through how we got here. Um, so this was a, a large study that kind of looked at about 10,000 patients in, uh, that were part of multiple studies. Um, and it really broke them down into um, these five different, different ish groups. Um, and if we look at them, you know, there is uh, about 40% of the patients had a ratio that was greater than or equal to two in an average HER2 copy number that was greater than four. So these are our amplified patients. Um, when you look at them with immunohistochemistry, it's three plus. And these are the patients who really derive a, a benefit both in disease-free survival and overall survival when they're treated with trastuzumab. Um, there is a, another category of patients. They made up a much smaller percentage of patients that has an amplified ratio, but their average HER2 copy number is less than four. And when you look at these patients, they were included in some of the initial HER2 trials because their ratio was greater than two. But when you stain them by immunohistochemistry for HER2, they're typically zero or one plus. And these patients really did not see an improved disease-free survival or overall survival when treated with trastuzumab. Um, another small category were those patients who have a non-amplified ratio, so it's less than two, but their average HER2 copy number is greater than or equal to six uh, in, across the tumor. Um, unfortunately, the, the, this is a rare genotype, so there's really very um, a small cohort that it's too limited for more analysis, but these patients did have worse, worse disease-free survival and overall survival than the non-amplified group. Uh, the other group 
that made up about 4% were those that had a ratio that was less than two, but their copy number fell between four and, and six. And when we looked at those by immunohistochemistry, they are zero or one plus. Um, because their ratio was less than two, these patients did not get trezituzumab, and um, they actually had outcomes that were similar to the non-amplified group. And there we see our, our non-amplified group makes up the majority of the patients in this study, and that correlates with the zero or one plus immunohistochemistry. So that's kind of how we got to these uh, updated guidelines and the need to really correlate um, these patterns with in situ hybridization. So it's an integrated report. You're looking at immunohistochemistry along with the ish results um, when you have one of these group two, three, or four patterns. Um, group two is that group where that they, they appear amplified by ratio, but they have a HER2 uh, copy number that's less than four. Typically, these patients are ER positive. As we said before, they're usually zero or one plus on HER2 um, immunohistochemistry. So um, a lot of labs work uh, with immunohistochemistry as their upfront testing. So they're being um, you know, deemed to be equivocal by immunohistochemistry or two plus, and then they're going on to in situ hybridization. And what we see on in situ hybridization in this setting is um, kind of in, the, in the, the call out in the right, you can see there's uh, frequently two copies of our orange signal with only one copy in some of these cells of our set 17. So we end up with a, an amplified ratio, albeit not highly amplified, but it, it will be greater than two, um, uh, but our HER2 copy number is, is very low. So how do we report these? So if we have this group two in situ hybridization with an immunohistochemistry that's zero, either zero, one plus, or two plus, then you know it's an integrated report and it's negative with comment. And basically what is known about these tumors is included in the comment that the, the CAP um, and ASCO um, have included, basically that these this genotype in these patients were included in the first generation trials, but they really didn't derive much of an improvement. Um, so therefore, if their immunohistochemistry is not three plus, it's recommended that they are actually deemed to be HER2 negative because of the overall low HER2 copy number by um, in situ hybridization and the fact that they, they don't have overexpression of, of protein. So our next group is group three. Um, remember, these are the patients who have a ratio that's less than two, but an average HER2 copy number that's greater than or equal to six. Um, these tumors are more heterogeneous. Um, they may be either ER uh, positive or ER negative. And the same thing uh, with immunohistochemistry for HER2, you may either see those that are, are negative or, or positive. And again, no good outcome data on these patients because they weren't included in the original trials. So if we go to uh, what these look like under fluorescent microscopy, you can see there's definitely increased copy number of our red signals. Uh, and in this example, the average turns out to be eight. Um, but we can also see there's increased copies of our green signal as well. Um, so there's about six copies of, of our CEP17 enumeration probe in each of these cells. So our HER2 CEP17 ratio is less than two, and it's about 1.3 in this example. So how do we report these? Um, if our immunohistochemistry is zero or one plus, and we have this corresponding ish pattern, then really the comment from ASCO CAP is that there's insufficient data on the efficacy of HER2 targeted therapy um, in this setting. And if, if the IHC is zero or one plus, it's recommended that the specimen be considered HER2 negative. Um, it's different if our immunohistochemistry is two plus. If it's two plus, then you know we're we're reflexing to fish to, to determine the status. If we are counting our ish signals and we get this pattern, then we need to have another observer count another 20 cells. Um, if it stays in that ish category, then it is considered to be HER2 positive, um, even with the, the two plus immunohistochemistry. But there's the caveat that there really is limited data to indicate if the patients are gonna receive a benefit from HER2 targeted therapy in this setting. And again, um, if you have this ish pattern, but the immunohistochemistry is three plus, then the result is just HER2 positive. The last group is the, the largest of the uh, these groups. Um, 
and it's group four. So these are the patients who have a ratio that's less than two, but their, their HER2 signal, um, uh, their average HER2 signal falls between four and six. So typically these are ER positive, um, again, usually zero or one plus by immunohistochemistry for HER2. And these patients weren't included in the original HER2 trials because they weren't considered to have a ratio greater than two, but they really have similar outcomes uh, without trastuzumab uh, to HER2 negative patients. This is what a group four typically looks like under uh, fluorescence. You can see in the panel of the left, we have a couple uh, cells that have uh, maybe four or five uh, copies of HER2. We can see them as kind of this more faint orange probe signal. And then we also have increased copy of uh, the green probe as well. Um, so in this example, our average HER2 copy number per cell is about 4.6 and our ratio is about 1.4. So um, it's a group four. So how do we report these? Well, if we have this group four pattern on in situ hybridization and our corresponding immunohistochemistry is zero, one plus, or two plus, these should be considered um, HER2 negative. Um, uh, and it's just thought that um, there isn't, uh, there's no good data on if these patients are going to derive benefit. Um, I would say that this is a confusing. Uh, group just because this, if, if we're going to get questions from clinicians, it's usually either on the group two or the group four. And the, the wording from the CAP and, and ASCO is really, um, yes, they are considered negative if this is the IHC pattern of zero, one plus or two plus, um, but always take it back to the clinical correlation and what are the other, you know, patient factors, what's the grade of the tumor, um, is there ER expression or not? And then it, it becomes more of a, um, a treatment discussion uh, at tumor board. So heterogeneity um, and heterogeneous staining. This is a, an example of a, a case where we see this uh, invasive ductal carcinoma that's um, high grade um, uh, on the left. And on the right, we can see that in the upper panel that essentially there's no expression of HER2, but on the, the bottom uh, right, you can see that there's strong circumferential diffuse membrane staining in probably greater than 10%. So, you know, by rights, this is a, a positive case, but this is an example of, of heterogeneous staining by immunohistochemistry. This is a, a different case that actually has heterogeneity as far as the tumor. Um, kind of off to the, the upper left, you can see a more low-grade pattern. Um, and then in the callout, you can see there's an area where our invasive carcinoma develops uh, higher grade nuclei. It's really mitotically active. There's some single cell necrosis as well. So there's heterogeneity morphologically. Um, so what do we do with these cases? And I think it's different if we're talking about HER2 heterogeneity as far as in situ hybridization goes. Um, the update addressed HER2 heterogeneity um, identified um, by in situ hybridization in the supplemental data. So you kind of have to dig for it. Um, but it's defined as an aggregate population of amplified cells. So it can't be um, a, you know, scattered cells within the tumor. It needs to be a very discrete uh, cluster. Um, and they need to compose greater than 10% of the total tumor cell population. If you're finding this pattern when you're uh, looking around, then you really need to count both different areas. So you need to count 20 non-overlapping and contiguous invasive cancer cells in your two areas. So your area that's amplified as well as your area that's non-amplified. And then you calculate the ratio for each of these cell populations and report them. And um, you report it as positive for HER2. I like to include that it's got a heterogeneous genotype. And you report the percentage of the total tumor population. Um, and we report it both with the, the population that's amplified and the population that's non-amplified. And this is an example. There's our uh, upper panel, we see our lower grade area and under uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization, we can see there's effectively, you know, basically two copies of both red and green signals. So this is our non-amplified component. Um, whereas if we look at this area, which is our higher grade area, we can see we have multiple copies of HER2 um, uh, identified by this really increased copy number and really bright signal. Um, 
of our HER2 probe here. So we have uh, an amplified clone and it is um, forming a very discrete population. And this is when immunohistochemistry can be very important in, in helping guide the scoring of these areas. Um, it's nice to be able to have this to, to guide it, although uh, when you are assessing in situ hybridization, you need to um, kind of evaluate the entire core, um, especially if you don't have immunohistochemistry to guide you, you need to make sure that you're not potentially missing pockets uh, of amplification. So it's a, a general overview of the entire tumor. So what do we really know about these heterogeneous tumors? Um, they're frequently associated with a, a larger size and a higher histologic grade. And um, studies have shown that typically they have greater frequency of lymph node metastases. Um, these patients seem to be less responsive to anti-HER2 targeted therapy, but I'm gonna say that's a trastuzumab containing regimen. Um, uh, this is taking it out of the um, kind of antibody drug conjugate realm and, and speaking more about um, uh, trastuzumab uh, alone uh, regimens. These patients um, typically don't get uh, the pathologic complete response that you see um, in patients with very uniform amplification or overexpression. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Sahin. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the guidelines that Drs. Brown and Downs Kelly uh, described cover the great majority uh, of the cases uh, regarding her to, uh, evaluation. And it is very important to follow these guidelines very strictly. But I would like to present a couple cases uh, where uh, even with the strict guidelines, uh, we still have some issues in terms of her to evaluation. And uh, also, I would like to describe some of the uh, new uh, modalities uh, that we have in a pipeline for uh, HER2 evaluation in clinical practice. The first case is a 58 years old woman who had T2 and 1 invasive ductal carcinoma, which was ERPR positive and HER2 positive, which was three plus IHC and FISH amplified. And she developed bone metastasis two years after her initial uh, diagnosis. Tumor biomarkers were performed on her bone uh, biopsy and metastatic tumor was uh, ERPR positive uh, as the uh, initial tumor, but uh, it was HER2 2 plus on IHC, and it, uh, we performed FISH, and it was non-amplified. So a question on this case is, does she have a, a HER2 positive or HER2 negative tumor? Since in our practice, we base our decisions on HER2 and hormonal status of breast carcinoma, it's important to highlight that tumor phenotype may change from primary tumor to metastasis. In a recent uh, systematic uh, review and meta-analysis, there was an, uh, this uh, study showing that uh, both for ERPR and HER2 can change from primary to uh, metastasis. For estrogen receptor, conversion rate was around 22% from positive to negative and 21% from negative to positive. For progesterone receptor, conversion rate was around 49% from positive to negative and 16% uh, from negative to positive. For HER2 loss, uh, which occurred in 21% uh, of uh, cases uh, with HER2 positive primary tumor and HER2 acquisition was rare, but occurred in 9% of cases. So we have a significant number of patients that we have this phenotype uh, switch. And when we look at these discordant biomarker results, Obviously, there might be multiple reasons. It can be sampling uh, error in uh, focally receptor positive cancers, uh, both in, in primary and metastatic setting. 
and limited accuracy and reproducibility of essays due to technical issues that both uh, Ali and uh, Aaron uh, discussed. And definitely it has been shown that a genuine switch in biology of the disease can happen uh, from primary tumor to metastasis. And there are also some metastasis location uh, specific differences. More uh, ER uh, discordance results uh, can uh, happen uh, in bone metastasis and higher diversity in bone and liver metastasis have been uh, described. So in general, we know that breast cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. And one uh, important take home message that I would like to uh, highlight is that we really need to assess uh, tumor biomarkers uh, when we have a metastasis. And the biopsy of metastasis now is endorsed by multiple international guidelines whenever is possible, especially when disease course is unusual for the known phenotype of primary tumor. Dr. Brown has mentioned about uh, lobular carcinomas, uh, even though a great majority of time they are HER2 uh, negative, but if uh, they uh, present with a metastasis, which is unusual, then it is important to biopsy the metastatic site and perform the biomarker uh, studies. Other main question in the clinic is that uh, it is not very clear which results should be used to drive therapeutic uh, choices. So in our case, it was a ERPR positive, HER2 uh, positive tumors, but then the metastatic site is HER2 negative. So this patient should be treated as HER2 positive and HER2 negative. And this is a major question in medical oncology. And there are some uh, very strong uh, opinions in this uh, field. According to the Advanced Breast Cancer International Consensus Conference in 2021, the recommendation was to consider the use of targeted therapy for HER2 when receptors are positive in at least one biopsy, regardless of timing. So if we are going to go with this uh, recommendation, this patient had a primary tumor, which was HER2 positive. So she should be treated as a HER2 positive tumor. On the other hand, some oncology groups say that the most recent biomarker status is more important. So it should be treated as what we have right now. When a switch happens from negative to positive is easier to handle in clinical practice, but when from positive to negative happens, like in our case, really we do not have a clear guidance from oncology community. And therapeutic options for metastatic breast cancer patients are becoming now more and more personalized and diversified according to tumor phenotypes and biomarkers in addition to only for ERPR, her 2 new that we use as a standard markers. So it should be now encouraged to integrate the results of metastatic uh, biopsy uh, markers uh, with clinical judgment in order not to miss the opportunity of more personalized treatment and possibility of enrolling patients in uh, clinical uh, trials. So the second patient is a 65 years old woman who had T1N1 invasive ductal carcinoma, which was ERPR positive and HER2 equivocal uh, 2 plus IHC, and FISH was uh, negative. And the uh, initial, during the initial evaluation uh, of the patient, uh, an oncologist requested oncotype and the recurrence score came around uh, 20. But at the same time, oncotype report showed that it is her two positive patients. 
So then the question comes in, is this a HER2 positive or HER2 negative breast carcinoma? According to IHC and uh, FISH, it is negative, but according to Oncotype DX, it is a HER2 positive tumor. As you know, that uh, Oncotype DX assay provides a recurrence score uh, in addition to ERPR and uh, uh, HER2Q uh, uh, RT PCR uh, result. And the main uh, question now comes in is the messenger RNA level of HER2, is it uh, significant uh, or not? And it is definitely biologically, it should be significant. But unfortunately, we don't have adequate clinical data. So with the current clinical practice, assessment of HER2 status in patients with breast carcinoma using any molecular testing, including Oncotype DX, uh, should not be a substitute uh, or complement FDA approved uh, approaches to HER2 testing for decision, treatment decision making. And uh, obviously we don't have extensive data on this and there are many studies uh, are ongoing. And this is more uh, becoming more important, uh, especially in metastatic setting. Obviously, we don't use Oncotype DX, but we are using other molecular uh, testing for metastatic breast cancer. So the messenger RNA level of HER2 now is being critically evaluated, especially in metastatic setting. Are there any fact, other factors that influence the response to therapy in HER2 positive tumors. This is now, especially in a metastatic setting, it's a very important uh, question uh, from the medical oncology point of view. Definitely HER3 level, gene expression profile of the patient, uh, the uh, DNA mutations and tumor microenvironment are all extensively uh, studied. HER3 uh, is another member of the EGFR receptor family has been shown to play a crucial role in driving the oncogenic cellular uh, proliferation. And it has been reported to play a resistance to anti-HER2 uh, therapies. So it is now shown that expression of HER3 is uh, important, but we don't have a specific clinical testing methodology for that yet. And there are some anti-HER3 drugs under development. So these uh, clinical trials are on the way. And uh, we may see some of these HER2 expression being uh, used uh, in our clinical practice. The other important uh, issue to remember is that HER2 positive breast carcinoma itself is also a very heterogeneous disease. In addition to HER2 status, hormone status of the tumor is very important not only uh, the uh, anti-hormonal uh, receptor treatment, but response to anti-HER2 treatment. As you can see here, that when we look at the gene expression profiles of HER2 positive hormone receptor positive tumors, great majority of these tumors are luminal type tumors. In contrast to HER2 positive, hormone receptor negative tumors in the second pie, great majority of these tumors are HER2 enriched tumors. And it is, we know that this is very important that in, uh, many of the anti-HER2 therapy treatments that we have are a lot more effective into HER2 enriched uh, category. In addition, we are a little um, short in time, so I'm just going to go to the remaining slides real quickly. So uh, we have the uh, PI3CA mutations. HER2 mutations is very important. These are all very important markers that we are evaluating right now. None of them is used in clinical practice, but many of them are used in clinical uh, trials. 
uh, there are many uh, prospective uh, studies uh, with sufficient uh, follow-up data uh, showing that all these markers and tumor microenvironment are very important in response to uh, anti-HER2 treatment. So all these techniques are uh, going to be available. And obviously, uh, HER2 imaging and leukoid biopsies are also extensively studied in uh, many clinical uh, trials. So I'll stop here and then give a few minutes uh, for uh, questions. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, Dr. Downs-Kelly, and Dr. Sahin. Let's uh, take a few questions and comments that have been coming in. A question refers to Dr. Brown's slide. In the lobular carcinoma with the three positive IHC staining example that was given, what happens if the fish is negative? Would the IHC then be considered incorrect? Does confirming with fish possibly muddy the waters? Actually, the three of us were talking uh, about what happens when there is an IHC three plus, just period, not just in a lobular phenotype, but uh, and then fish ends up being negative. It's a very uncommon thing to happen because usually we would not fish a three plus positive immunohistochemistry result. Um, in my experience, those patients still are afforded treatment, uh, but I will also defer this to Dr. Sahin and Dr. Downs Kelly. Yeah, uh, this happens very rarely. And if, if it happens in early stage breast carcinoma, uh, our approach is to repeat this staining uh, and fish on resection specimen to see if there is some heterogeneity and if there is a, some technical issue with the core biopsy. If it is a metastatic setting, um, our medical oncologist approach uh, is to treat this as a HER2 positive tumor. And there are also some uh, people uh, feel that there might be some uh, overexpression of HER2 without uh, gene amplification. It is supposed to be extremely rare in breast carcinoma, but it can happen actually in GI and GU tumors. There are other mechanisms for uh, protein overexpression without amplification. So on those organ systems, uh, either three plus or fish is considered as a positive. Okay, thank you. Another question might've been covered by Dr. Downs Kelly. Can you please discuss all the CAP checklist requirements that you use in your laboratory for HER2, ER, and PR? Well, that's an easy question. <laughs> Dr. Downs Kelly, do you want to talk about, I mean, maybe in a nutshell, kind of a... Uh, are we talking about the pre-analytics and how we uh, incorporate those into our report? If that's what you're you're talking about, yes, we uh, make sure that every single you know cold ischemia time, um, length of fixation and type of, of fixative is documented in the report. Um, you know we run into problems with um, decal. We get a significant number of uh, metastatic um, uh, breast to bone biopsies and. Um, unfortunately, uh, sometimes those are, are put in decal, and then we have an issue um, falling outside the guidelines in that, and then what do we do if we're equivocal by, by IHC and for HER2 and need to fish it, and then your DNA is degraded by the decal and you can't get a fish signal, so that that's, uh, can be a real tricky situation. There have been several excellent questions. Let's take one from the chat because it's short. Decalcification of bone specimens, will that affect IHC results? This comes up all the time, right, Dr. Sahin? We were just chatting about it. Yes, uh, it will affect, but it is not as much as it affects fish. Uh, with uh, fish, the uh, hybridization is a lot more affected uh, by decalcification. And of course, uh, when we say decalcification, there are different methods. And uh, so that's the reason we try to make it very gentle uh, in uh, our uh, lab. And if there is any discrepancy between fish and uh, IHC on the bone uh, biopsy, we try to uh, use uh, any other material if it is uh, available. So that's the recommendation. But uh, IHC is affected less compared to fish. 
Thank you. One remaining question. Let's squeeze it in. Regarding the phenotype changes in discordant biomarker results, would you recommend conducting both HER2IHC and HER2FISH to confirm HER2 status? Definitely. Definitely. Oh, nice short answer. <laughs> well, we are at the end of our hour here. I want to thank our presenters and everyone for taking part in the discussion today's her too low session and please take 30 seconds to complete the brief survey as you leave we rely on your input to shape future educational initiatives we also would like to invite you to save the date for upcoming video conferences next tuesday february 15th will be state-of-the-art biomarker testing in gastrointestinal cancer and march 31st will be implementation of cap iaslc amp 2018 molecular testing for NSCLC. If you would like to claim credit, CME CMLE credit for today, please visit the breast cancer page at ASCP's website or go directly to the ASCP store using the direct links in the chat. ASCP will also send directions and the links for claiming credit to the email address under which you registered. Thank you again presenters and all participants, and this concludes today's presentation.